Good afternoon and welcome to VPM's live coverage of Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin's first address to the Joint Assembly. I'm Karis Manzanares. Youngkin was sworn in on Saturday, becoming the 74th governor of Virginia. He is the first Republican to win statewide office since 2009. Building on his inauguration speech, we can expect to hear Youngkin lay out his agenda and what he envisions Virginia becoming in the next four years. As he promised on the campaign trail, Youngkin started working on day one. After being sworn in, Governor Youngkin signed 11 executive orders, including ones banning critical race theory education in schools, ending mass mandates in schools, and COVID-19 vaccines for state employees. He also appointed a new parole board. During his term, Youngkin has said he wants to reduce taxes and has proposed eliminating the grocery tax. The governor has also stated that he wants to allocate more funding for schools and raise teacher pay. We now take you live to the House of Delegates Chambers where Governor Youngkin will deliver his first address. Assembly will come to order. Sergeant at Arms. Mr. President, His Excellency, the Governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia. The members will rise and receive the Governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Please be seated. As Speaker of the House of Delegates and President of the Joint Assembly, it is my pleasure to present to you His Excellency, the Governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia, the Honorable Glenn Youngkin. Thank you all very much. Well, good afternoon. <laughs> Standing here before you and looking around this room, I'm struck by the history that's been made in this very place, the people's house. I'm also struck by the fact that the work that you do here has great consequences for the people of Virginia. And so it is today as we gather here. Mr. Speaker, Madam President, Lieutenant Governor Earl Sears, Chief Justice Goodwin, 
and the justices of the Supreme Court. Members of the General Assembly and my fellow Virginians, today we begin anew, all of us together. After years of fractured politics, a deadly pandemic, lives and livelihoods lost, soaring mental health and incidents that have woken us all up to the challenges that this pandemic has caused, including drug overdoses, rising crime rates, ever-increasing costs for housing, food, and fuel, Virginians have sent us here to turn the page. They came out in record numbers to make their voices heard. They chose a new vision for the future. Today, I want to speak to that vision and begin our partnership to address the priorities of the people. I've enjoyed getting to know so many of the members of these two legislative bodies, both Republicans and Democrats. You've invited me to your homes. You've shared meals with me. We've done community service together. And I thank you for that. We are all part of Team Virginia. And as I shared on Saturday, we can take inspiration from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s life, which we celebrate today. And we can take inspiration from his words that we may have all come on different ships but we're in the same boat now. The work we have to do together, we must start today. And there isn't a better example of people coming together on behalf of Virginia than the brave crews, the law enforcement heroes, the first responders who worked during yesterday's storm. They worked in the freezing cold ice and snow to keep our streets safe keep the lights on, and to keep our hospitals open. Before I speak to the work ahead, I want to recognize someone who has traveled with me every step of the way. She inspired me to live a life of faith as a younger man. She's an example of humility and strength, not just to our children, but to women across this great commonwealth. She's the best partner I could ever imagine our First Lady, Suzanne Yunkin. After years of campaigning at diners, senior centers, schools, housing projects, courthouses, even pickup basketball games, I've taken the measure of our people. I've found them to be resilient, optimistic, and courageous. I've listened to their hopes and concerns, to their dreams and fears. Their stories of inspiration and their stories of tragedy. Some cried on my shoulder. Some prayed over me. And some spoke bluntly. Maybe a little too bluntly at times. Almost all expressed a desire for Virginia worthy of the ambitions of its people. I come here today to echo their clarion call for change, to form a government that works for ordinary citizens, that's a catalyst for opportunity and not an obstacle, and that addresses the kitchen table concerns of working families that are real and mounting. It's been said that all great change starts at the kitchen tables across America. You see, that's where families talk about what matters to them, 
It's also where parents discuss their worries. Their worries about stagnant wages in the face of rising expenses, caring for an elderly parent, which I've done twice over the last four years. They worry about trying to find a way to save for their children's future. I want to share with you something that I know we all have heard from voters. They're genuinely concerned that the cold halls of government are disconnected from the cold realities that families face while sitting at their kitchen tables every day. In that respect, we shouldn't misconstrue record revenue for government as economic success for Virginians. The view from the people whose labor generates those tax receipts is quite different from the talk in Richmond. They see an economy whose growth has stalled at less than 1% for the last eight years, with household incomes stagnating over the last year as the cost of living has skyrocketed. They see declining schools. They see violent crime reports dominating the news. They see record low labor participation. They see small businesses struggling. And they see government failures and encroachments on their liberties. From the perspective of the everyday Virginia family, times are tough. And the state of the Commonwealth is not what it should be. Today we're at a proverbial tipping point where the cash flow to the government from rising tax burdens is very high. And yet the impact of high costs and high taxes and an increased regulatory burden are clearly being felt in the real economy and the real lives of Virginians. The good news is that we have the ability to course correct before this poor performance becomes permanent. With current and projected tax-driven surpluses, we can lower taxes on Virginia families and make critical investments in those key pillars to the great Virginia promise. The great Virginia promise of a lower cost of living, excellent schools, safe communities, a rip-roaring economy that lifts up all Virginians. To do that, I'm asking each of us in this body, Republicans and Democrats alike, to come together, to rise above the Richmond of division, special interest, the small and parochial, and to usher in a sweeping vision of change, and to put this commonwealth on a pathway to prosperity. On day one, we hit the ground running, signing 11 executive actions and swearing in a full cabinet of outstanding individuals who are qualified and share Virginia's values. As of today, we've worked with legislators to introduce 59 pieces of legislation to tackle our day one agenda. And we'll be submitting a package of 25 budget amendments to reflect are bipartisan priorities. We're addressing issues that are critical to the future of the Commonwealth and that every member in this chamber can get behind. Virginians have given us a license to lead. It's a temporary license. They have charged us all to deliver on a day one agenda. We know on some issues there'll be deep disagreements. But I believe this chamber is big enough for us to talk through our differences. And there is more that binds us than divides us. For we all share a common goal, to leave a better Virginia to our children. We're going to start by investing in Virginia classrooms. 
Education is the key to opportunity, the means by which all children and their parents can realize their greatest dreams. Virginia schools have a lofty reputation, but lately we've not lived up to that reputation. In fact, our education standards for math and reading are now the lowest in the nation. Unelected political appointees lowered standards, which inevitably led to a decline in student performance. 60% of students don't meet national proficiency standards including over 70% of Latino students and over 80% of black students. They're failing to meet the standard on the math NAEP tests. Remarkably, these dramatic declines noted by the National Center for Educational Statistics have only seen one Virginia school that was deemed failing because accreditation standards were lowered. Starting now, we're ending the accountability shell game intended to make us feel good, but amount to the often stated soft bigotry of low expectations. Let's stop cheating our kids. Friends, on this we should join arms and join in purpose so that when our time here is done, we've collectively raised education standards from the lowest to the highest in the nation. I'm also calling for $150 million to help us meet our goal of starting 20 new charter schools. Whether they're called charter schools or lab schools or Innovation schools, it doesn't really matter. I don't care what we call them. I just care that we do it. We're joined today by the students of Green Run Collegiate Charter School in Virginia Beach. Green Run Collegiate shares a facility with Green Run High School. They have an innovative curriculum. They provide access to every child in the school district to attend the collegiate program. They're thriving, and their parents are thrilled. So please join me in welcoming these future leaders to our Commonwealth's capital. We're going to build partnerships between the Commonwealth and our great universities to create lab schools of excellence. It could be a lab school in Southwest Virginia in partnership with UVA Wise. It could be an entrepreneurship or entertainment industry focused school partnering with one of our amazing historically black colleges and universities. Or a partnership with Old Dominion University for opportunities in offshore wind or maritime. When it comes to the educational budget, I've heard consistent bipartisan agreement from all of you that the budget you'll pass and the one that I'll sign will reflect a record investment in education. And it will include a significant boost in teacher pay.
With the exception of a parent or a guardian, no one impacts the future of a young child more than a quality teacher. We will attract quality professionals to Virginia schools, and we will pay teachers as the professionals that they are. We must also recognize that the people most responsible for a child's education are parents. My message. <laughs> My message to parents is this. You have a fundamental right enshrined in law by this General Assembly to make decisions with regard to your child's upbringing, education, and care. And we will protect and reassert that right. Hear me clearly, when parents are empowered and parents are engaged, a child's life is enhanced. I've heard the concerns of parents about curriculum. Virginia's parents want our history, all of our history, the good and the bad, to be taught. And they want their children to be taught how to think not what to think. And that's why I signed a directive yesterday, an executive order, formalizing that we should not use inherently divisive concepts in schools, including critical race theory, and why we should not be teaching our children to see everything through a lens of race. That's also why I want to give parents the right to be informed before their child is exposed to sexually explicit materials. Please. Send me the same bill that you passed on a bipartisan basis in 2017, and I will sign it. The classroom environment must be safe so that our children can learn. I'm asking members of this General Assembly to prioritize school safety by putting a school resource officer on every campus. I also ask you to join me in protecting students from sex trafficking organizations that recruit them on and off campus. Let's train educators to see the signs of trafficking and to stand in the gap for children at risk of being preyed upon. <laughs> Let's also involve law enforcement agencies in the approval of school safety audits. And whenever someone preys upon a child in a Virginia school, we must require it be reported to local law enforcement for investigation. No more cover-ups. No more sweeping it under the rug. Parents deserve to know if their child is at risk. 
Schools exist for the educational benefit of children, and for that reason, they must remain open. I strongly encourage everyone to get the vaccine for COVID-19. And, and please stay standing, because I strongly encourage you to get the booster as well. As we battle COVID, it's parents that should decide the health measures taken for their children. That's why I signed an executive order that allows parents to opt out of mask mandates in schools. This is a matter of individual liberty. Again, this body passed a law that protects parents' fundamental right to make decisions concerning the upbringing education and care of their children. And healthcare workers should get to make those decisions too. I will continue to oppose President Biden's COVID vaccine mandate for health workers as we continue to fight a crisis of staffing across Virginia's health care system. Our fight against COVID-19 will move forward based on this simple principle. We will protect lives and livelihoods. As I said on Saturday, it simply means Virginia is open for business. It also means the science since the beginning of the pandemic has not been static. We now have therapeutics, better testing protocols, and fortunately, a less severe variant. And of course, we have vaccines. It means educating our friends and neighbors and encouraging them to get the vaccine and the booster. There are 1.6 million unvaccinated Virginians today. And speaking to you as your governor, I'll never tell you what you must do. But speaking to you as your neighbor and your friend, I strongly encourage you to get the vaccine. The data is clear. People who do not get the vaccine are four times as likely to be hospitalized. The vaccine will not only help keep people out of the hospital, it will also keep people working, earning a paycheck, and growing our economy, something that has to remain a top priority for all of us. Our day one plan will jumpstart jobs. We're going to repeal needless regulation. We're going to invest in job training. We're going to foster innovation. And we're going to win the competition for jobs and corporate relocations. I support a significant investment in mega sites to make sure we don't lose. You bet. You bet.
to make sure that we don't lose the next advanced battery manufacturing plant after seeing several go to Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Georgia. And while we're at it, let's broaden the baseball stadium authority to include football, and perhaps we'll get one of those too. I want our rural Virginians to know we're spreading prosperity far and wide, and rural Virginia won't be left behind. We're not only bringing jobs, we're bringing high-speed broadband. Every governor for the last decade has stood in this chamber and told you that rural broadband was a priority. This time, we're going to get it done. We're also going to make sure that key projects at our ports and our highways are completed. So the message is clear. If your cargo container ships are stuck off the coast of another state, come to Virginia. And guess what? We won't make supply chain problems worse with more regulatory red tape. And let me be clear. I believe in the fundamental right to work. And if anyone tries to bring me a bill that creates forced unionization, it will meet the business end of my veto pen. The states around us have created more jobs, grown their economies faster, and took steps years ago that we must take now. Lower taxes, business-friendly regulations, workforce development, and more. This is a real competition. And to win, we have to play to win. One of the other challenges businesses face especially small businesses, is the high cost of providing health care for their employees. Over the last three years, you all sent the governor eight versions of an association health plan bill to make it easier for workers to get health care. It was vetoed eight times. Pass that bill again, and I will sign it. Virginians are struggling with the high cost of living in a commonwealth with skyrocketing housing costs, rising fuel prices, and the silent wage theft of inflation. There are economic fundamentals that we don't control here in Virginia. They must be dealt with at the federal level. But Washington continues to fiddle in the face of real supply chain challenges and allow our nation to be overly reliant on China for critical goods and services. But there is one vital thing we can do to help Virginians, and that is to remove some of the tax burden added on top of rising prices for groceries, gasoline, and housing. 
That's why I support suspending the recent gas tax increase for one year and fully eliminating the grocery tax immediately. There is bipartisan support for eliminating the grocery tax, and together we will give Virginians tax relief. We also need to give Virginians a real break on their personal income tax by doubling the standard deduction and providing the largest tax rebate in Virginia history. These tax cuts benefit the people who need it the most and represent the largest tax relief ever given to the people of Virginia, $1,500 this year for the typical Virginia family. But beyond the economic implications of this package, I believe we have a special obligation to a group of individuals that have served our country with distinction, our military veterans, those who risk life and limb for country and community don't do it for the pay. They do it because service is in their blood. The care and support of our veterans have always transcended politics and been bipartisan. That's why I'm asking this General Assembly to act on something long talked about. Let's eliminate the tax on the first $40,000 in military retirement pay, and let's do it together. Anyone who wears the uniform risks their life each day on the job. And this includes police officers, firefighters, EMTs, every first responder that keeps us safe. We're in a fractious era. And no group of individuals is under greater scrutiny today than our law enforcement. A culture of lawlessness has filled the void in Virginia with violent crime on the rise. In November, Police officer Michael Chandler of the Big Stone Gap Police Department was violently gunned down by a vicious criminal. Incidents like this are all too common today. We'll never know the depth of this loss to his family, but we grieve with them and pray for them. In Virginia, we must stand with our law enforcement agencies and therefore, I'm asking you to fund our police to protect our communities. Officer Michael Chandler's widow, Natasha Chandler, is also a member of law enforcement. She's a Wise County Deputy Sheriff who, even after losing her husband, insisted on returning to serve. She's watching this afternoon. Please join me in recognizing the sacrifice that her husband, Michael, made on all of our behalf. The budget submitted to this General Assembly includes pay raises. Pay raises for troopers, sheriff deputies, and corrections officers. Those are strong first steps I know we all support. But we need to provide more funding for our police departments and more funding for training and equipment. Together, we should dedicate $100 million in ARPA funds to a training and equipment grant program for law enforcement and provide capital funding for a new state police training facility. Furthermore, 
I'm asking you to dedicate $26 million in state funding for police departments, but only in localities that are increasing funding for their police departments. We'll also fund community violence intervention by dedicating at least $5 million to Operation Ceasefire. It's time to take down the temperature around the discussions of policing. The solution is in constructive engagement and dialogue, not inadequate funding. Inadequate funding creates more lawlessness. And when it comes to lawlessness, I want to be crystal clear. If we won't tolerate it in the communities across the Commonwealth, then we certainly won't tolerate it within a state agency. On Saturday, I fired the entire parole board. Attorney General Meares to begin an investigation into what happened. The violations of law and the Constitution, the unconscionable refusal to notify families, to notify families of victims about pending decisions to release murderers, they were simply unacceptable. We will not accept selective violations of our constitutional rights. We will protect all of them. We don't get to pick and choose the parts of the Constitution that we want to preserve and protect. In order for our government to work for the people, we must also reform the institutions of government that fail to serve the people. I'll admit, I've never run a government agency, but I do know something about running a business. And we're going to bring business efficiency to government bureaucracy. That's why I appointed a Commonwealth Chief Transformation Officer to oversee government transformation. We will make government more responsive, more efficient, and more transparent. And we'll start by fixing the Department of Motor Vehicles and the Virginia Employment Commission. Furthermore, we will be innovative in leveraging federal transportation funds to address the challenges of growth and gridlock. In Virginia, we are going to build roads, bridges, rail lines, utility lines. We are going to be better prepared for weather events that strain our highways and the electric grid. And we will marshal our resources to make our infrastructure the most reliable in the nation. As I travel this great Commonwealth of Virginia, I remain in awe of the raw natural beauty of Virginia. The mountains, waterways, beaches, parks, farmland, livestock, vineyards, and natural resources testify to our Creator's artistry. I deeply treasure the natural beauty of Virginia, and my administration will dedicate itself to protecting and promoting it as a core principle of our service. 
That's why we will end the dumping of raw sewage into the James River once and for all. I also support fully funding best management practices on our farms in order to protect our soil and water from the Chesapeake Bay to the Jackson River. And, <laughs> and we are going to see the cleanup of the Chesapeake Bay to the finish line. Coastal resiliency is critical to me, and it's critical to our nation because of our port and military assets in Hampton Roads. That's why we're going to create the Coastal Virginia Resiliency Authority to battle rising seas and make sure the federal government does its part, too. Let me state our goal. Let's work together in partnership. Let's work together to build a government as virtuous as our people, one that serves. You don't have to look too far to find examples of that spirit among the people of Virginia. I met a veteran, I met a veteran of our military on the campaign trail by the name of Natasha Berrien. She's an immigrant. And like so many first-generation immigrants, she loves this country with a passion few can understand, though certainly our Lieutenant Governor can. Natasha knows what life is like in other parts of the world, which is why tears flowed down her face when she told me about her journey, her pride in serving in our military, and the hopes and dreams she has for her daughter to grow up in a better America. Natasha represents the best of America. She may not have been born here, but she is every bit American as someone who was, because she has lived the ideals of this great land. Natasha is watching today. Please join me in recognizing her service to our country and her dreams for her daughter. Virginia is home to heroes, many living and many who lie in eternal rest. I attended the funeral of one such hero last month in Virginia Beach, the commanding officer of SEAL Team 8, Brian Bourgeois. Brian could light up a room with his laugh, and he could put his subordinates at ease during the most tense moments. He gave his life in service to freedom. He left behind a wife, Megan, and five great children, one of which, Barrett, led us in the Pledge of Allegiance on Saturday. What price would we in this room put on freedom? For some, freedom is so precious, they would offer everything in its defense. Those of us who live in the freedom they so valiantly protect must live lives worthy of their sacrifice. Let's set aside petty divisions. Let's set aside ego and self-advancement. And let's join together 
to make this Virginia that we love better, stronger, freer. My friends in this esteemed legislature, I'm inspired to be with you this afternoon. And I'm inspired to be working with you to build a future of limitless opportunity and to strengthen the spirit of Virginia. Thank you, God bless you, and may God bless the Commonwealth of Virginia. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. You've been watching Governor Youngkin's first address to the Joint Assembly of the House and the Senate. Going into the legislative session, Republicans in the House have the upper hand and are supported by an all-Republican leadership. This year, Democrats have not filed many bills in the General Assembly as they are now the minority in the House. However, Governor Youngkin has said he is looking forward to working with Republicans and Democrats to put the needs of Virginians first. Joining us this afternoon is Delegate Eileen Filler Corn of the 41st District and Senator John Bell of the 13th District with the Democratic response to the governor's speech. Good evening, Virginia. My name is Eileen Filler Corn, and I have the honor of representing Virginia's 41st District in the House of Delegates and to serve as leader of our House Democratic Caucus. I am joined here today by Senator John Bell, who represents the 13th District in the Virginia State Senate. Today is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. We celebrate the life and work of an iconic civil rights leader who committed himself to speaking for the voiceless and fighting for the most vulnerable among us. What we heard today from Governor Glenn Youngkin, however, is a plan for Virginia that would leave so many behind. In the midst of a pandemic prolonged by misinformation that is taking an economic, medical, and emotional toll on Virginia's families, Governor Youngkin put forth an agenda that will take us backwards. For months, Governor Youngkin has told Virginians that policies like increasing funding for public education, raising the minimum wage, and making our Commonwealth more inclusive were bad ideas Instead, he has advocated for rolling back that progress that has improved the lives of so many. While the governor speaks of unity and moderation, the substance of his administration and its proposals have been anything but. We must do everything we can to safely keep our kids in school. Democrats worked hard to ensure all 132 divisions were open for in-person learning. Governor Youngkin's day one action to remove mask requirements is irresponsible and puts all of that in jeopardy. Disturbingly, he also removed vaccination requirements for healthcare workers, the individuals who come into closest contact with those most vulnerable to the virus. With these steps, Governor Youngkin has made it clear that he sides with those who oppose vaccination his decisions will only serve to prolong this pandemic. Governor Youngkin has also put forth extremist nominees to lead his cabinet, nominees like Andrew Wheeler, Donald Trump's former Environmental Protection Agency administrator. Andrew Wheeler has a record of undermining the very protections that have allowed us to keep Virginia's air and water clean 
and his record on addressing the climate crisis is non-existent. He is also continuing his efforts to use division and fear to score political points. Let's tell the truth, clear and simple. Critical race theory is not taught in schools, but Governor Yunkin wants to put politics into the curriculum. Virginia Democrats have invested billions in new education funding and teacher raises over the past two years, including a record $2.3 billion in additional education funding in the budget that is before the General Assembly today. If Governor Yunkin is serious about improving education, he needs to leave that funding in place. As for his legislative agenda, let us look at the bills his Republican caucus have proposed so far. Bills to stop the minimum wage increase that'll benefit hundreds of thousands of working Virginians. Anti-choice measures taking women's health decisions out of their hands. Cutting early voting by over two thirds in an attempt to curtail participation in our democracy. This is not the type of governor Glenn Youngkin promised to be on the campaign trail. But instead of middle of the road solutions, we're getting extreme right-wing policy and policy makers dressed in a veneer of civility. Glenn Youngkin is out of step with the values of Virginians and his actions speak far louder than the words we heard today. House Democrats are committed to reaching across the aisle to make the lives of Virginians better and to continue our success as the best state for business in the country. Democrats are ready to work with Governor Youngkin to provide real tax relief, but only if any tax cuts are truly to the benefit of middle-class families and those who need it the most. But sadly, the policies of the Youngkin administration so far suggest nothing but a desire to take us backward. We hope the governor will have a change of heart, but if he does not, we will stand firm to protect the progress we have made. You have my word that House Democrats will work with our partners in the Senate to shine a light and stop actions by his administration that harm Virginians. Thank you for your time today, and it is our promise that we will always stand firm for the interests of you and your family every single day. I'm Senator John Bell, and on behalf of the Senate Democrats, we congratulate Governor Youngkin, Lieutenant Governor Sears, and Attorney General Miares, and look forward to working with them to continue the very important work of the Commonwealth. We applaud your desire to represent all Virginians and ensure everyone in our Commonwealth is treated fairly and offered a pathway to prosperity. Democratic leadership over the last eight years has firmly established Virginia as one of the best states in the nation to raise a family, start a business, and prosper. CNBC has named Virginia as the number one state for business two years in a row and the quality of our public schools is ranked fourth in the nation. Our health systems are some of the country's best, and more, than, and more Virginians than ever are covered by expanded Medicaid benefits, all because of Democrats' focus and dedication. While we agree improvements can always be made, we are gravely concerned that several of Governor Youngkin's proposals would jeopardize his progress. For example, Democrats funded transportation projects across the Commonwealth, these projects would be severely underfunded if Governor Youngkin's gas tax proposal becomes law. We are also concerned that renewable energy and climate change mitigations, which were enabled by the Virginia Clean Economy Act, will be abandoned. We cannot accept that. As a small business owner, I know that helping workers also grows our economy. We have several of Virginia's workers with us here tonight. Daryl Turner is a dedicated teacher in Richmond City Public Schools who now has a voice in the workplace because of collective bargaining. Anthony Salito has benefited from wage theft protection laws that Democrats pass that now protect the financial security of his family. John and Aieli obtained driver's privilege cards because of Democratic legislation and can now commute to work without fear. Senate Democrats will not forget Daryl, Anthony, or John and Aieli, and will ensure nothing eliminates workers' opportunities. Senate Democrats understand the value of a world-class public education. To this point, we must be clear. We will not agree with any proposals 
that seek to defund public schools or divide our citizens. We have worked across the aisle to raise teacher pay and invest in crumbling school infrastructure and look forward to working together to further improve our schools. As an Air Force veteran, I'm proud Democrats have worked hard to ensure no veteran, military family, or law enforcement officer is left behind. We have ended veteran homelessness and have ensured veterans have a pathway to prosperity. We have raised wages for police officers, invested in de-escalation training, provided mental health resources to assist with cold policing models, and established community-oriented solutions. We make great progress, but we know there's still much to be done. Senate Democrats have worked hard to represent every Virginian, no matter your job, gender identity, whom you love, race, ethnicity, religion, or zip code. And make no mistake about it, we will not retreat when someone's rights are threatened. We look forward to working with Governor Youngkin. Your success is our success. And our success together is Virginia's success. Together, we will make sure that all Virginians thrive without abandoning the crucial progress that the Democratic General Assembly and Governor Northam have achieved. Thank you. You've been watching VPM's coverage of the first address to the Joint Assembly given by Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin. We thank you for joining us on VPM. I'm Karis Manzanares.